This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. And now we're going to look at the audit report. We look at the audit report quite early on in the lectures, because really this is what the whole audit is kind of focused on producing at the end, an audit report to the members telling them whether or not the financial statements show a true and fair view. And all the other activities we carry on, like risk assessment and collection of evidence and uh, making sure the internal controls are working, they're all focused on being able to determine whether or not, in our opinion, the financial statements show a true and fair view. Now, the definition of uh, the audit report is a clear expression of opinion on the financial statements as a whole. And it has to be emphasised, I think, here, uh, that the uh, audit report is very much an opinion. Uh, that uh, you could have two different auditors. One would look at a set of financial statements and think they show a true and fair view. And another audit partner might have some reservations about it. Opinion and judgment are inseparable from auditing. Uh, there's no absolute rights, absolute wrongs, there's no guarantees anywhere in the process. And the opinion should be based on review and assessment of conclusions drawn from evidence obtained in the course of the audit. And if you wanted to think almost of another term that would describe audit, it is basically evidence collection. Collecting evidence that allows us to conclude with reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free from material misstatement. Uh, and, and all audit has to be based on evidence. If you can't get, get the evidence or sufficient evidence, then you can't give uh, really an audit opinion. The financial statements uh, should have been drawn up, prepared uh, according to international financial reporting standards, or if there isn't one uh, governing particular figures, the international accounting standards. The first thing we have to get uh, clear is what's meant by the financial statements as a whole. Uh, and here's what they are. It's a statement of financial position, sometimes or old-fashionedly known as the balance sheet, the statement of profit or loss, the statement of changes in equity, uh, the cash flow statement, and all the notes backing up these other statements. Very rarely there may be some other material as uh, has been identified as part of the financial statements. But in particular, note what is not here. The director's report, and the chairman's statement. Nor are other nice graphs and pictures and so on, uh, which frequently form part of our, you know, our listed company's annual report. So the audit is confining itself to basically these five, sometimes six, but basically five statements, financial position, profit or loss, changes in equity, cash flow, and notes. That's what we're reporting on. Not the director's report, not the chairman's statement, not any of the other stuff that nowadays you might find in a large, a glossy financial report. Now, what are the parts of an audit report? Uh, and this has changed recently. This has changed now uh, really for audit, uh, the audit of companies, uh, which uh, is uh, for periods ending on or after the 15th of December uh, 2016. And, and the September F8 exam will be the first time in which the new audit report, or sometimes it's sometimes called, uh, has been identified. And there are very radical changes between the content and order of presentation of information in the new order report to what was in the old order report. And if you're retaking, then you need to relearn this. It starts as before uh, with the title. It has to be entitled Independent Auditor's Report. It's like a big red flag waving to the members. Here is the order report. Make no mistake, this is what you're looking for. And it is uh, addressed to the members to the members of ABC Limited, Independent Auditors Report will be the title of that, that paragraph. And then, and this is a radical change, right at the top comes the audit opinion. Because uh, this, of course, is what people are really interested in. 
are the financial statements something we can rely on or are there problems with it? Uh, this comes right at the top after the, the title and the addressees there and it will define what has been audited. Uh, so it will list out statement of financial position, statement of profit and loss, cash flow, etc, etc, etc. And may even say in there uh, that it doesn't cover other parts of the annual report, but it will define what has been audited. This is to alert people what this report covers. It covers this, not any of the rest of it. And that's very important. This paragraph is called audit opinion, uh, or uh, it could be could have to have its name changed. It could be called qualified opinion, if that's appropriate. Uh, we'll see in the next lecture what these alternative types of audit report are. Or the title could be adverse opinion, or the title could be disclaimer of opinion. So, so again, what you're doing is, is like waving a red flag at the top of this top paragraph, really. Uh, audit opinion, if it's OK. But then it will say qualified opinion is a problem. It will advertise, adverse opinion will advertise a uh, disclaimer of opinion uh, as a title. After that, it gets on with what's called the basis of opinion. Uh, and again, that title would be changed to match the opinion paragraph. So it could be changed to basis of qualified opinion, basis of adverse opinion, basis of disclaimer of opinion. And here's where you explain how you got the opinion. In particular, if there's a, a problem with financial statements, why you think that the financial statement should be qualified in some way, why you, you know, you'd be explaining you think maybe a bad debt should be written off and it hadn't been written off. That's where the details of the problems are. So you keep the opinion fairly clean. Here's the opinion. Then after that, you the basis of opinion uh, where you add the detail to uh, how you've come to your conclusion in the opinion paragraph. Then, after the opinion, the basis of the opinion paragraph, you have what's called an emphasis of matter paragraph, if there is one. Again, you'll see this in the next chapter, but I'll tell you here, an emphasis of matter paragraph draws readers' attention to something which is properly, already and properly disclosed in financial statements. It could be, for example, saying, oh, by the way, after year end, the factory burnt down. So this would be disclosed in, or should be disclosed in the note of the financial statements. And again, this is saying to users, hey, look here, there's something you buried in page 100, not buried, but occurs in page 100. If you really understand the financial statements, you better go and look at that because this is pretty important. So again, it's another kind of warning be given to people, go and look at this important element. If there is a material uncertainty regarding going concern, uh, then this is where this will be looked at. So going concern is a kind of assumption uh, that the business will continue in the foreseeable future. If there is an uncertainty regarding this, it should be disclosed in the notes of the financial statements. Uh, and think of this material uncertainty relating to going concern as a kind of specialist emphasis of matter. It is saying, we think there's a real danger this company is not going to last typically for another year. You better go and look at the notes on page 64 or note 27, whatever it is, and see exactly what the company is saying about this going concern doubt. Neither of these, we'll say it again, but neither of these in any way modifies the ordered opinion. Okay, This is just a warning to people, go and look at this. Then we have something which we'll look at. This is a new section here, key audit matters. Uh, a lot of what happens in the audit is very routine, but every now and again there are issues where the auditor has had some trouble, has spent a lot of time, has maybe spent a lot of kind of heart searching and judgment deciding whether or not that matter has been correctly, let's say, valued, correctly treated. And people really ought to know this, this is where there may be some doubt. We, the auditors think they've come out on the right side of it. They think the financial statements are okay, uh, but maybe they have uh, had you know some trouble actually getting to that conclusion. We'll see a little bit more of that in a moment. Other matters, again, this will be explained more in uh, chapter six, the following chapter. 
Uh, this is uh, typically where you want to draw your attention to something which is not in the financial statements. It might be something of concern that you've seen in the director's report. You're not normally reporting on the director's report, but if the director's report uh, 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 included a, an obvious lie, maybe about how the company had gone on, then this is where you would red flag that. It then has two important paragraphs, setting out management's responsibility. Typically, management's responsibility is preparing the financial statements. It's management's responsibilities for ensuring there's a system of good internal control. It's management's responsibility for preventing and correcting fraud. Uh, so this is its management's responsibility for reviewing going concern. So that's put at management's feet. And then to say our responsibility is to audit the financial statements. And it will typically say that we do this on a test basis, a sample basis, which will allow us, allow us to draw reasonable conclusions uh, that the financial statements are free of material misstatement. Uh, so we're not giving any guarantees in this. It may say something about the, the sort of work that we do, that we look at transactions on a test basis. We don't look at all of it. We're not particularly responsible for finding fraud uh, 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 and so on. Uh, and it, it's laying down to people, we're not double checking everything. It's laying down to people that we're not saying that the company is a safe one to invest in. Uh, we're simply saying we have used our auditing processes to collect reasonable, you know, sufficient, uh, appropriate audit evidence to give us reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free of material misstatements. And then it is finished off by the date, the address and the signature of the auditor. Uh, the date is a date that the uh, uh, audit report is signed. That's quite an important date because the audit doesn't really end until the audit report is signed. And until the audit report is, is signed, the auditor is kind of on full duty. It says they have an active duty. They're still wondering whether the inventory is selling okay. They're still wondering whether those receivables are actually being received or whether maybe uh, one of the customers has gone into liquidation since the financial statements were drawn up. After the date of the audit report is signed, that's, that's like the finish of the audit, uh, then the auditor's responsibilities drop away down to what's called a passive duty. So if something is brought to their attention, which maybe says that the financial statements actually did have a material misstatement, then they would uh, think about maybe trying to correct the audit report, have the financial statements reissued and so on. But you must know these typical parts of an audit report. Key audit matters. Key audit matters are areas of higher risk of material misstatement. Maybe the valuation of inventory would be quite a good one. Significant auditor judgment is needed. Will it sell or won't it sell? If it's not going to sell, what should we write it down to? And so on. Uh, and the effect also of any significant events or transactions which happen during the year. So if uh, they became aware that uh, a major fraud happened during the year, they would have to satisfy themselves uh, that they found all the effects of this fraud that was kind of properly kind of reported. Or, or if uh, there was some difficulty in maybe the change over in IT systems and maybe some data got lost and so on, then this would be a key audit matter. Significant events happened during the year, a bit of a loss of data, and they would explain as best they could to the users of the financial statements what they did to try and satisfy themselves that nevertheless the financial statements are okay. At the end of the, the audit, uh, auditors uh, report uh, loads and loads of things are communicated to management. Problems, little errors, uh, difficulty in finding information and so on. Uh, from that you can pick out matters that require, some of those are relatively trivial, but you pick out the matters uh, that require significant auditor attention. Uh, and from that, you will select some of the most significant, the most significant uh, of areas, and these become the key audit matters, which you will describe in the audit report to give users a better understanding uh, of how the audit was conducted, where the difficulties were, and maybe how much reliance they can place on the financial statements. 
Now, the audit report, uh, hopefully, if it's a, what's called a clean audit report, uh, will uh, report that the financial statements are true and fair. Now, we have to have an idea of what this is, uh, true and fair. Uh, we'll think of true as being more or less accurate. It's not quite accurate, but, but it's, it, it's a good enough one. Doesn't mean accurate to the last cent, but reasonably accurate, uh, shall we say. No material kind of errors uh, really within that. Uh, fair is a more difficult uh, concept. Uh, fair is quite, uh, quite kind of tied up with almost the impression it gives. Whether maybe something is misleading or not misleading, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. And you have to be both. So uh, let's see how we can illustrate true and fair. So if we had in our financial statements, really, statement of financial position, if we had inventory uh, sitting at a thousand, uh, and if you had your receivables, let's say sitting at 200, and if you had your cash sitting at 100, so you have current assets of 1300 let's say the other side of the statement you do current liabilities uh, uh, sitting there uh, at let's say 1100 and therefore you'd have your, your net current assets or your working capital at 200. Now most people would look at that and get worried uh, because uh, you have to pay within maybe the next 30 days 1100 there in your current liabilities uh, and really, you've only got about 300 likely to be cash within the next 30 days. Uh, this inventory actually has to sell. And it could be several months before that sells. Now, this would illustrate that the uh, liquidity position of the company isn't so great. Now, if you kind of presented that, and the fairness is to do with the impression of the presentation, whether or not it's misleading, if you simply presented this information as current assets, 1,300, and current liabilities, 1,100, so you have your net current assets as before, 200, people could look at that and not get worried at all because basically everything's accurate, but the way it's presented is covering up, is concealing, it is in a way misleading people as to the liquidity. So here the figures would be true, but they are certainly not fair because they give this misleading impression. And order gives reasonable assurance that the financial statements are uh, free of material misstatements. Uh, and we have to think of what material means here. Remember, it's reasonable assurance, there's no guarantee, but a matter is material if its omission or misstatement would reasonably influence the decisions of the, uh, an addressee of the ordered report. And an addressee of the audit report is typically a member uh, of the company, a shareholder. So a matter isn't really material. It could be wrong, but if, if it's kind of not so wrong, uh, that it's not going to make you buy shares, sell shares when you shouldn't do, then it's not material. Uh, but if it was, let's say, materially overstated profits and therefore it uh, provoked you to go out and buy more shares, then, of course, it is influencing your uh, uh, decisions. It has to be remembered that materiality uh, uh, is both the amount and basically its nature and effect. Uh, so people would be slightly more lenient, really, maybe about inventory, because it's very difficult to value inventory absolutely accurate. Uh, but to be very, very strict about, say, the disclosures of director's emoluments, because there's no reason why you can't get director's emoluments down to the exact figure. Uh, so they wouldn't really let those be in any way kind of inaccurate at all. And also its effect. So you could have a, a company which for a number of years was showing kind of losses and losses and losses, and then maybe it shows a profit. And you could be looking at it, it might be a very small profit, of course, but you say it's been making losses, making losses, making losses. Now it's made a profit, it's turned the corner. And because of this kind of ray of hope which you get here, 
you keep the shares. Uh, whereas really, this actually might have been a very small loss. We're not talking about a big profit or a big loss. We're talking about a small profit or a small loss, almost a trivial profit or a trivial loss. But now you're seeing loss, loss, loss. My goodness me, it's still a loss. This company's never going to come right. Uh, I'll get rid of my shares. I've given it enough time. So materiality uh, depends on both the amount of the misstatement and also its nature and also its effect. There are both quantitative and qualitative aspects to materiality. Now, when the audit team is sent out, uh, it, it has to have an idea of what is material. It's ultimately the partner's responsibility to decide whether an error or an omission or, or some problem with the financial statements is material or not. That's a matter of judgment. Uh, but you have to convey to the relatively junior people doing the audit uh, when something is likely to be material. Uh, there's no point in auditing BP and getting excited about an amount of you know $1,000 or something of that sort. It, it's really neither here nor there. Uh, so so uh, uh, what you tend to do uh, is you have what's called a preliminary assessment of materiality. Uh, and this is really a communication exercise. This is what you would give to your junior auditors. And really, it's like the partner saying, let me know if there's any error, uh, which is kind of half to 1% of revenue or above, of course, or any error which is 1% to 2% of total assets or any error which is 5 to 10% of profit before tax. This is where, in terms of its size, an item is getting perhaps big enough to be uh, interesting to me. So they go out armed with this sort of uh, information uh, here. This is what's called the preliminary estimate of materiality. Uh, this doesn't mean it is material, uh, but it's a preliminary estimate. It's a good, it's a good indication that it's probably material. And if you ever, in a question, get uh, revenue figures, asset figures, profit before tax figures, uh, and then you're asked to consider some errors in the financial statements or effects on the audit report, you would be expected to uh, make some calculations as to whether or not the error which has been discovered are large enough, really, material enough to get excited by. Now, you could have, uh, you know, these indications of materiality, but what would happen if I, I found an error which was like, say, let's take it on, on profit here, an error which was kind of 2% of profit, and goodness me, another error which is 2% of profit, and maybe a third error which was 3% of profit. Uh, and let's say all of these kind of overstated the profits. So we're ending up there, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, we're ending up there with a 7% overstatement of profit. None of the errors themselves might be material, but they can stack up, if they all stack up in the same way, they can become something which is material. So the concept was then kind of invented that, that when we're telling people what is material, this here might apply to the, the, you know, the, the finished financial statements, if you like. But when you're actually on audit, you should be reporting and sensitive to even smaller errors, just in case they all add up to a relatively big effect at the end. And that's what's known as performance materiality. Materiality is for the financial statements as a whole, but uh, when you're designing your audit procedures, uh, you will maybe set a lower amount than you might expect uh, to uh, tell your audit team what to report. In other words, they're going to be reporting more errors, they're going to be reporting smaller errors, uh, in case, as I say, they all aggregate to something which is material uh, to the financial statements as a whole. You're allowed different percentages to take into account. So were items, items were used as focus. So you wouldn't be uh, allowing very much error at all in something, as I said, like director's emoluments. You wouldn't allow very many errors of any type of sort really at all in cash. There's no reason why cash at the bank shouldn't be absolutely accurate to the last cent. You might, however, uh, be more forgiving about inventory or Depreciation, depreciation of non-current assets is always a bit of an estimate anyway. So there's no point in getting maybe too worked up about that. 
as always is kind of new consistent with last year and, and, and so on. Finally, the implications of the audit report, not mentioned in the audit report, but that proper records have been kept, uh, proper returns from branches not visited have been received. The financial statements actually agree with the records and returns, so they're not based kind of on fiction. That the auditors have received all explanations necessary, that have received all information they need. Directors' emoluments properly disclosed, directors' loans and other transactions are correct and information in the director's report is consistent with the financial statements. It's this place here where quite often you get one of these other matter paragraphs coming in, where the director's report says we've had a marvellous year, far better than last year. The financial statements say, no, we haven't had a marvellous year. The, the profit is actually lower than last year. Uh, you, you don't have to report that it's consistent but you would draw people's attention in another matters paragraph if it, the non-financial statement information was inconsistent with what you've audited.